But I want to look at vaccines and the pandemic now. And as you know, there's global controversy, global concerns now about the AstraZeneca vaccine. That is the one that is now being manufactured in Australia. That is the one that is the workhorse, the go-to vaccine in Australia. And these concerns about blood clotting that have uh, stopped the administration of this vaccine to some cohorts of people in some country... Uh, it's now found its way to Australia and the Prime Minister has asked our authorities to have a good look at this, but he's urging calm. Have a look at Scott Morrison in Canberra earlier today. And my message to Premiers and Chief Ministers this morning is the same message to Australians. We've got the best people in the world looking at these issues to give us the medical expert advice. Our government has always... Um, approach this pandemic and all health issues to be led uh, by medical expert evidence and advice and we'll be taking that today and the decisions will follow from that. There's the Prime Minister urging calm and we'll wait and get that latest advice uh, in Australia. At the moment the vaccine is still being rolled out primarily to people at the front line, the healthcare workers and also to elderly Australians, especially in aged care facilities. Let's cross to Paul Griffin now, infectious diseases expert. He's in Brisbane. Good to talk to you, Paul. First up, uh, oh, how, having me. how to keep this in perspective? Of course we need to be uh, concerned about any possible side effects from vaccines, but the last thing you want to do is frighten the horses. How would you, how would you reassure the public? The, the key message here is every medical intervention has some uh, side effects, unfortunately. And the thing with this one is the rate of this event, while it's significant, is exceedingly rare. So what we're talking about now is an uh, event in the order of around five per million, even if it is related or that, that's still uh, yet to be proven. And what's really clear from the reviews by all the regulators at the moment is that the benefits still outweigh those risks, albeit remote. And what's happened in, uh, in Europe at the moment is because the, the gap between those benefit and risks, because because the, the younger people have uh, much lower risk of consequences, is, is a bit less. And so they've chosen to offer an alternative in that group. But they're um, still recommending this vaccine for the majority of people at the moment. Look, we know that people who are most susceptible to uh, serious illness and death from coronavirus are, of course, the very elderly or, or people with other pre-existing uh, conditions. Is that why AstraZeneca is, uh, is not being administered to, to younger people, just because... It's not as necessary for them? Or is the side effect believed to be more pre prevalent in younger people? It's a little bit of both of those things. So, yes, you're right. The, the risk of significant consequences of this virus is much lower in the younger people. And the majority of these cases, again, albeit still very low numbers, have occurred in younger people. So it, it makes sense to take a cautious approach and, and just recommend that perhaps they consider an alternative vaccine on offer at the moment. Look, I just want to ask you about the utility of younger people getting the vaccine. Now, I'm far from an anti-vaxxer. I, I really want the vulnerable. I'm so pleased that some of my elderly relatives have been vaccinated and others are, are in the queue. Uh, and it's a no-brainer, of course, for elderly or other vulnerable people to, to get vaccinated against COVID-19. But if you are a 20, 30-year-old, otherwise healthy person in Australia, your chances of getting sick and seriously ill or dying from coronavirus are so tiny. What is the utility in having the vaccine? Look, that's very true. The chance of uh, significant consequences is less. Still not zero, though, important to point out. But the other point is that th those people um, are the main people that transmit this virus. So while they're less likely to get really sick themselves, they're likely to be the ones that do pass it on to their grandparents and other elderly or vulnerable people in the population. So, so while they may not get too sick, they're responsible for a lot of the transmission, which is why we need to also keep in mind that they still need to be vaccinated. Well, that leads us, though, to the other question about the vaccine. And my conversations with various experts tells me that the jury is still out, and that is the extent to which the vaccine actually stops people picking up the infection and passing it on. It seems certain that it reduces that opportunity at least. Do we know any more? Look, you're right, we're absolutely certain that it does, to a degree, reduce the chance of people getting infected and reduce the chance of them passing it on. Those things are really hard to measure. So they're not things we have good numbers on, like we do about efficacy in the clinical trials. So while we know it does that to a degree, it's really hard to give a firm number. But we do know those people, those young people, while less likely to get sick, are responsible for most of the transmission. And if they're vaccinated, we will reduce that transmission at least to a degree. So it's really important that we consider that point as well. Just before I leave this topic, I just want to be very, very clear about this because I want our audience to be absolutely have clear information from you. Uh, with AstraZeneca at the moment, given all we know, 
especially if you're elderly. If you're someone who's in a vulnerable group lining up to get the vaccine soon, uh, the advice is absolutely go ahead. That's the best thing for you to do is to get that vaccine. That, that's exactly right. The benefits far outweigh the risks. It's really important to get that vaccine. Obviously, as uh, more data emerges and the, uh, more reviews of what's going on uh, are released, this advice uh, may be updated in time, but it's certainly very clear at the moment that the benefits far outweigh the risks. So definitely st still keep using that vaccine. Now, I'm very pleased to see that Hotel Quarantine is up and running in Melbourne again. They've had uh, two cracks at it so far. They've changed some of their practices. Uh, how can we get some calmness around this because what we've seen in all the other states uh, and, and of course in Victoria is you can expect at some stage there'll be a cross infection in the perfect world maybe not but uh, it, it's a highly infectious disease and we've seen in every state really at some stage there's been cross infections the idea is to get on top of them quickly and not to panic. Yeah, look, that's exactly right. I think we've done a reasonably good job of finding those breaches early and identifying those people and reducing the impact of those uh, cases escaping from hotel quarantine. I guess the big thing now is we also have the vaccine. So, uh, again, that will certainly help that situation and reduce that risk further. Not a solution in itself, though. We need all those other things to be uh, to be as good as possible to reduce that risk. And my understanding of the, the revamped hotel quarantine system down there is that there's a lot of measures in place to make sure that every risk is uh, reduced as much as possible. So, you know, I think that's our best option is to have a comprehensive suite of uh, mitigation strategies to reduce that risk to as low as it can be. Just uh, one qu other question occurs to me before we go. There's a lot of uh, talk about the various vaccines and their efficacy and the rest of it uh, and uh, a lot of studies on their in impacts and v potential side effects. Is work still ongoing? Are, are, are companies and institutions still looking at more vaccines for this very same virus or even refinements to existing vaccines? Oh, absolutely. The, the work is ongoing. We're very carefully monitoring the, the rollout of the vaccines that are in use now, both for efficacy and safety, of course. And there are a lot of other vaccines underway to, to address some of the issues we may face with some of these vaccines, including uh, better handling variants, for example. So, you know, there's around 84 vaccines in clinical trials at the moment in various stages. And, and there'll be a, a lot of other vaccines that will come through that, you know, for example, might offer properties like being able to be given orally or being more stable at room temperature, things like that. So, yeah, lots more vaccines to come. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure.